Welcome to the Story Powers podcast, the show about the power of stories, the people who tell them, and why you should be doing it too. I'm your host, keynote speaker and storytelling coach, Francisco Mafus. My guest today is Malakai Talabi. Malakai is the 2011 UK and Ireland Toastmasters International Speech Champion, and that year he placed third in the World Semi-Final in Vegas. He has been certified as a world-class speaking coach by the great Craig Valentine and is the author of Smash It With A Story, But I'm Not Funny, and Public Speaking Hacks. Today, Malakai helps entrepreneurs and leaders tell unforgettable stories and give profitable presentations. He is also the only person I know who goes to church, talks about sex, and is still invited back. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Malakai Talabi. Malakai, welcome to the show. Woo! Let's put our hands together for that intro. I need to book you as an MC to bring me on every single time I speak. Fantastic intro. Glad to be here. You don't know this. When I got the opportunity to come on this podcast, I was like, yes! I went to my wife. I said, boobs, man. Boobs, finally I've arrived. I'm on the Story Power podcast because I see the caliber of guests that you have. And I'm like, yeah, these are big players, you know, you you only bring in people who you know can add value to the audience. So I was like, yes, it's like a dream come true. So actually, you might think this is a small thing, but for me, I'm like, yes, I want to speak to someone who knows the power of story. And I know who's got an audience who are hungry to find out more about storytelling and just generally how they can give good presentations. So thank you for having me on here. <laughs> well, you know, obviously, I, I wanted to have you on. You know, we've we've spoke spoken a lot on on social media about about storytelling, and and I'm I'm sorry if actually being on the podcast and and seeing that you know I'm recording this in my daughter's room, completely <laughs> surrounded by pillows, this might come across as less glamorous than the <laughs> the view from the outside was, but uh, I'm, I'm sure we will have plenty to to talk about. And the, the first thing I wanted to to ask you is that I know that you you won some some awards in public speaking, and the very first award you won, uh, or at least the the biggest award you won, was that national one. And that was only I think you said something like you had only been speaking in this type of you know sort of more professional uh, way for like nine months or something. So I I, I dove into Toastmasters. I didn't want to go. My wife had said to me. Oh, she found Toastmasters on a computer and she said, you should join. And I, I, I didn't know that people got paid for public speaking. And I didn't know that people trained in public speaking. Like it was something that people had to be trained to do. I, you know, I just spoke and I ignored her. I said, oh, like, that's silly. Like Toastmasters, <laughs> I, was actually, I found it kind of nerdy, like trained to speak. Do you just speak? Then I think the next day I was in church and I was leaving. I didn't want to be there. As in, there was a football match on, so I wanted to leave. And a guy, like, he's like a black uh, version of Sir Alan Sugar called Joss. Very businesslike, smart. And he said, oh, Malachi, um, how are you doing? And I said, I'm fine. And he said, you know, what have you been up to? I said, nothing much. So I said, what have you been up to? He said, I've been making a lot of money. And I was like, you know what I mean? Money, like, that got me interested in the conversation. So I said, how have you been doing that? And he said, uh, first thing I did was I joined an organization called Toastmasters. Now, the thing about it is my wife was standing next to me when he said that. And it was like, he's saying join Toastmasters. My wife's saying join Toastmasters. I'm in church. I felt like God was saying join Toastmasters. I joined and I think I, I actually, I didn't like it. I was there. It was weird for me. People were just clapping and stuff like that. But I, I promised myself I'm going to do my first 10 manuals. And when it got to the place of my 10th speech, I just went there and they said, oh, you can't speak today because it's competition day. And I was like, oh, man, it's competition day. And no, no, actually, no, Francesco, it was my third speech. On my third speech, it was the humorous competition, um, humorous um, speech contest. And I just wanted to get in there and get out. So they said, you have to enter the competition. I entered the humorous speech contest. I won. Uh, then after winning the humorous speech contest, the guy comes up to the stage and says, oh, there's a next round in, um, on Saturday. I went to the next round. I, I won again. So I was like this area champion, like all these Toastmasters give me awards, stuff like that. I went to the semi-final of the humor speech contest on the, two weeks later. And during the break, a woman came up to me and said, Malachi, like, you're quite funny, but I think you're good enough to win the international speech contest. So you should enter. 
And I was like, yeah, I didn't place in the humorous contest in the semi-final. I ended up entering the international speech contest in, I think, was it in March or so? And I just spoke and won and won and won and won and won. I'm going to be honest, Francesco. When the announcer said, and the UK and Ireland public speaking champion is Malachi Talabi, it felt like, how? And then when I went to Vegas and I, I placed third in a close semi-final, the guy who won my semi-final came second in the world. Again, I left Vegas like, how? And then I started to get people asking me to speak at conferences and workshops and things like that. And I was petrified, not because I was scared of speaking, but I didn't actually know what was good about my speaking. So I had to do about three months of reflection. Mm. And I found that the one thing that I was doing in every presentation was telling stories. So that's how I found kind of like storytelling. So if anyone wants to be in a place where they say, I don't know how to speak in public, I don't know what to do. I know it might sound cliche, but what worked for me was nine months of stories. All I did was get up instinctively. I didn't have a blueprint. I didn't have anything like that. All I did was get up and tell a story, uh, how I went from being like kind of this racial abuse and poverty and all of this stuff. And it just identified with people. So for me, I always say the best speakers are the best storytellers and the best storytellers are the best speakers. So if you want to start, like storytelling is the thing that birthed my entrance into public speaking. Uh, listen, I'm going to obviously come back to the storytelling part, but th there's some things in there that I want to I want to I want to pick apart. So first of all, I mean, I'm pretty sure that anyone that listens to this podcast knows what Toastmasters is, but as you said, it's an organization, it's a public speaking organization. And you said, you know, I didn't like it. I thought it was very nerdy. Well, it is very nerdy. It is the nerdiest <laughs> thing ever, and it's out of it, and I say this without necessarily being too detrimental, but it's very very American, right? You know, it's like the, the clapping and it's like this artificial positivity that everybody mm. in Toastmasters has. But the reality of it is it is very positive. I mean, people are super super supportive and, and they're very, uh, the, the feedback is always constructive. So the one thing that, you know, you said something about Toastmasters the other day on social media and someone came in and said, oh, wait, now I came in and I didn't like it. And I thought it was, almost everything that everybody says about Toastmasters as a criticism is true. Mm. But what's also true is that it's a very supportive environment to practice public speaking and learn. And it's also one of the only places I know that you could genuinely be talking every week, if not every day of the week, uh, because it's set up for that. Like if someone says, mm. I want to become a better speaker, but I, I do not want to join Toastmasters. So, okay, well, I, I'm not quite sure where you're going to practice. I know there are other clubs that there are opportunities to speak and things uh, and things of that nature, but I just haven't really, you know, I, I just don't know. I find it difficult to to see where where exactly you'd be doing this if it weren't for Toastmasters. The other thing which I think is interesting is, in a way, you are very lucky because Toastmaster rules say that you need to have had three speeches already or four speeches before okay. you can compete. So, you know, had you gotten there you know, speak <laughs> earlier, you wouldn't have competed at all. Yeah. And, and the other point that I think it's also interesting is because you were so new, I guess you hadn't been doing evaluations. No. Which is, you know, so for someone who doesn't know those masters, what part of the meeting is improv improvised, then you have prepared speeches and then you have evaluation. So you do a speech and then someone goes up there and says, okay, Malakai, you've done this really well. These are the things you can improve on. So anyone who's been at Toastmasters for a while would have been doing evaluations, which also makes you a lot more aware of the things you are doing well and the things, mm -hmm. or should make you aware of the things you're doing well and the things you need to improve on. And it's, I, I think it's interesting, the idea that you competed and, and did quite well competing without having that developed yet. Because, you, you know, you're looking at your speech and going, is this good? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I guess I'm going to find out soon. <laughs> yeah, just that whole just freedom. Like, I just want to I just want to speak. I don't want to do no evaluation. I didn't want to do anything. I just want to get in there, get out. I'm only here because I feel like I, I have to be here. So many coincidences and things like that made me be, you know what? I'm going to do it. And I didn't, I wouldn't say consciously, but I didn't let anything you know, you have to pause here. You have to. I didn't really. As soon as I spoke, I kind of left the, <laughs> I left the club. I just wanted to get over and done with. So I think that sometimes, if you have too much feedback, it can 
over refine you and they talk about you know use your hands in a chopping motion and you become robotic and to be honest I had to unlearn some things that I just wouldn't it felt uncomfortable to stand before a paying audience or a professional audience doing some things that are very like you said before theatrical in your body language and you mentioned like with Toastmasters if you're kind of new to public speaking or you've got a message you want to refine a free or like a very almost basically free audience giving you feedback that you can even film I've seen professional speakers go to do a Toastmaster workshop and film the workshop and use that as a do something to prove that they've got they've had stage time you know so they, they're on stage and that's really good because it is a legitimate audience or things like a humorous presentation if you want to go out there and kind of test your content and you literally just have you can see what the audience how they react how they respond or you want to refine a joke so I think Toastmasters definitely if you're working on content and you want free kind of audience feedback it is priceless I guess that the biggest obstacle with because because it's very easy to criticize Toastmasters and and a lot of people do, including including us. But yeah. I've been but I've been a member now for almost ten years, and mm. you know there's, there's no question that the the feedback on content is very valuable. And even though I have been speaking for a long time, like you have competed, I've won some stuff, but yeah. I still find that I it's rare that I don't get any type at least one piece of feed, uh, feedback mm. or advice that I I kind of forgot, right? You know, I go there and I, I I did a speech a few weeks ago and I did this whole thing on, I actually probably will record it and put it on the podcast, but I, I did this whole thing on the history of vaccination and the anti-vax movements. And I mean, it's a, it's a super interesting story and I, you know, I made sure there was some humor in there. And then someone gave me feedback that is feedback that I know because I put it on my book and I told everyone, which is, it needs to be personal. Now, I, I don't, even if it is, how is my interaction with the subject? How did I find out about this? And I could have done that, and probably will do it if I record it, in two or three lines to say, oh, this okay. is why I'm talking about this. This is why it matters to me, Francisco, and not to, you know, every single person. And sometimes you forget stuff like that. So I, I also think that the focus that a lot of public speaking coaches and definitely Toastmasters has with body language and the delivery side of things, you know, your voice and your and your body and your hands and your stage movement. My feeling is that those things are much easier to master in the beginning than teaching someone content. Because you can make someone who was super, super nervous look confident on stage and walk the you know walk in a way that seems confident and you know the, all the gestures and everything it's a lot harder to get a person that is not a good writer you know doesn't or in, struggles to identify stories i think teaching someone to be a significantly better speech writer is yes. way harder than teaching someone to sort of look the part on stage it does go a bit too far, and that becomes a focus that is not overly relevant. But I think that if they've made the, the focus a lot more about content right at the beginning, you wouldn't have a lot of the easy wins that you have for, for people that are not natural. And yes, I'm going to hazard a guess here that a lot of stuff came naturally to you because if, I've seen you speak and I know there's stuff that you do that is not something you learn, you've you been taught at Toastmasters. Like, for example, you do voices. You know, you have... Yeah. You, I, I'm crap at that. I can just go, you know, my, my daughter's voice is, Daddy, can you... I cannot do accents to save my life, but you definitely can. So uh, you're right. I think um, uh, one of my, my mentor always told me, as soon as I met Craig Valentine, he said, public speaking is... 10% talent, 90% tools. And before I got into Toastmasters, unconsciously, I've, I've been speaking all my life. All my life, my mom made me present at parties. And, you know, I think I had some time. They told me to do announcements at church. So I've been speaking, I've been doing all these things all of my life, school plays. So when it came, I've never been kind of afraid to speak in public. So to a degree, maybe that's why from my first speech, I've always only had positive feedback but I now know that I probably would have ended up being a run-of-the-mill Pentecostal Christian preacher who can tell a good story and then say hallelujah you know <laughs> things like that if I hadn't learned things like you know the rule of three 
it's the little it's the little nuggets the rule of three or you know when you squeeze your um information in you're squeezing your audience out because people digest things at different paces or pausing you know all these little or conflict in the story and bringing it forward to the early parts of the story if i didn't learn all of these things i think i would have still got a generally good response okay he's interesting but to take it to a level where one i can kind of support people with what they want to do but also i can now say this is something that people would pay for and it's not just a guy with the gift of the gab who's saying some stuff who's good at persuasion and i think that just having those elements you know books like your book you know where you, where someone can come to your book and look at it and say hey this is how to structure a presentation this is how to tell a story it's not just um jumping up on stage and saying a few words there's actually an art and a science to storytelling so i think that has come to refine me because there's a guy called philip campani um, who who came second in the UK, I mean, the world, and he's the highest placed person in the UK, barring one woman who I think has won it. And he saw me speak and he came up to me afterwards. He said, Malachi, like, one thing I have to tell you, you're very talented, but you're not trained. And he is the only, out of all the Toastmaster feedback I got, well done, Malachi, you're this, you're that, you're great. There's one person who who was a professional speaker, who got paid to speak, you know, who, who's been around the world, traveling across the world speaking and saying, hey, like I see a talent in you, but there's 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 no skill to it. You're just off the cuff, run of the mill. And I think that um, having an environment, whether it's Toastmasters, whether it's Francesco, this podcast, or but where you're picking up these little nuances and science of speaking, you can add that to you to your speaking is is actually a game changer. I think the challenge with being trained is what you're being trained on, because one of the most one of the most jarring things you can do if you've been into the, you know, once you start getting familiar with the public speaking world is most people's exposure to that nowadays is TED, TED Talks. And yes. and by, by Toastmaster standards, most TED speakers are not great speakers by Toastmaster standards yes. because they are oh. not technically proficient. By yes. most people, they are good speakers. But most people's standards, they're good speakers. And I and I would argue that if you take, if you look at professional speakers, you know, the people who are genuinely getting paid to do this and getting feedback and getting back, going back to do it. I mean, if you watch them speak for an hour, a lot of them seem some sort of strange mix of a stand-up comedian and some person who knows a lot of stuff and has not really done a great deal of speaking again if you're coming from a from a technique point of view you know there's this guy i think is incredible and is you know well known to be one of the best uh, professional speakers in the world called scott stratton and um I, you know i can send you one of his keynotes it's a stand-up half of it's like stand-up comedy and then he's talking yeah. about marketing and he's talking about stuff put him next to to you know the guy who, a guy who i know interviewed you i think was his name was uh mark Bucknell, Simon, Simon Bucknell. Bucknell. Right, so I, Simon yeah. Bucknell finished second in in the Toastmaster, in, second in the world. Now I yeah. I started watching that speech, and I didn't make it through it because it it's so theatrical that it just doesn't really work outside of that environment. It's a, you know what what is amazing is that exact same sentiments you had about because I know Simon I know Simon quite well in in Toastmasters in the UK, like he's, he's the guy like, oh, Simon, you know, especially it's coming second. I think the first time he, years ago, he's competed a lot. He became like um, second in the semi-final. And I watched like when I found out Simon came second in the world, I'm like, whoa. And I went to watch the speech. And similarly, um, I know it's an old speech he gave like 10, five years ago, but he's, it came second. And like you said, you, you're like, okay, there is diff a difference between a contest speech and a professional speech, and you can see it. And with the professional speakers, you said a huge mix between humor and then content. And one woman uh, I met in my second meeting, she said, Malachi, and she probably set me free. She said, Malachi, you're in Toastmasters, you're good. She said, she said, you want to master anything. These are the two pillars of public speaking, storytelling and humor. And I, I, I bought a book by Joanna Slan, I believe it's called, and it's called Telling, I'm Telling Stories with Humour. And I read that book. That's the first book I think I read on public speaking. But that was it. Storytelling and humour. And that's like the, I've got something called the presentation pyramid. And I, I talk about how in this pyramid, like the base of the pyramid is the biggest part 
for me of public speaking is it is a storytelling at the bottom. And then above storytelling, I put metaphors. And above metaphors, you've got humor. And then in that middle, middle top part of the, the pyramid is phrases. And then on the edge of the pyramid, you've got interaction and um, questions or questioning the audience. And if you wrap your that presentation around those things, so you think, I'm going to make this point, I'll, I'll use a metaphor. I'm going to make this point, I'll use a story. I'm going to make this point, I'll use a phrase. I'm going to make this point, I'll use some humor and mix in the questioning and the interaction. Then generally, it's a, like a, a nice presentation. So those two pillars, especially in the professional world, like a lot of them have had stand-up comedy training. And what I did, I mean, with my mentor, Craig, he's the most conversational speaker that I sort of know. And because I was trying to go into the keynote world and create workshops, I just knew in myself that my contest winning speech, I could not deliver it in front of a professional audience. I, they wouldn't buy it. It was too... What was that speech, by the way? Because I, I couldn't find it online. So what was, the, what was the main story or what was the more or less the idea of the speech? Yeah. The idea of speech was um, growing up in a racist area in Bermondsey, and I was racially abused by someone. My mum was poor, my dad wasn't with me, and just my journey about how I kept on walking through racism, through poverty, through my dad returning and um, not being impressed with my exam results, and the message was just keep on walking, keep on walking, keep on walking, and that was the title of the speech was keep on walking, and then I told three, I did it like I told a mini story phrase, keep on walking, mini story phrase, mini story phrase. And then at the end, I just called back. Yeah, I forget what's the rhetorical device for that now, but that's one of my, that's one of my favorites when I'm, when I'm doing like Toastmaster style speeches. Like I did one, one of the last ones I did before everything shut down. I was, you know, I just had my second child and everything was not ideal uh and i i think my, the line was something like um you know i love my children but i don't always love my life as a parent and that ca- that um, kept coming back over and over yeah so i i'm very lucky i guess because i i'm fully aware that stories should be personal and whenever i tell stories about my life they auto they're automatically humorous because i keep having all this ridiculous stuff happen to me <laughs> so, <laughs> you got content. Yeah, I don't need to. I don't need to be looking for humorous stories. It's just like so. You tell me a personal story. Yeah, I'm talking ta- ta- talking about my, you know, my failed first marriage or my Tesco divorce. Uh, or you know, it's all it's all ridiculous. So I don't have to make it up. Um, all right. So one thing I was going to mention that I have found to be very useful, and it's something that it's not what I used to do when it comes to being conversational and preparing speeches. And I think this applies to to anyone, uh, not just, you know, people like us who are more involved in this world, is that I almost always wrote my speeches first and then I made them more conversational by reading them out loud and, okay, well, this line doesn't work. I need to change it around. And I've been finding more and more that the opposite approach is the better one. So I will say them first get a feel for the flow, get a feel for the stories, then I'll write down, you know, the lines I really want to get right and everything else stay. Even if I write it in full afterwards, I'm writing yeah. in full something I said first. So it's it's oral communication recorded and not written communication, you know, communicated orally. Yeah. I mean, to win the contest, I wrote my speeches out. This is what I did because you've got a seven-minute time limit. You have, like... You find out your speech rate and you think, okay, I've got to write. And then a part of the contest forms is words, the way you use words and metaphors and similes. So I'm writing my speeches, but I'm having to memorize what I've written because I don't write how I speak. And the spontaneous part of the brain, I believe it's the right brain. The creative part is the right brain. And isn't isn't that debunked now? I keep I keep having this <laughs> argument on social media. I'm pretty oh. sure that the whole right and left uh, is debunked. Oh. Okay, well, okay. I don't know. Yeah, but, but well, that, and also well, the learning styles thing is like, oh, I'm a kinesthetic okay. learner. Oh. It's just like no, no evidence. There's no evidence. So. Okay, so all I do know is that when I write, I'm more likely to refine what I've written if I type on a on a Microsoft Word. But in my mind, doesn't have a spell check. So when it's coming out of your mouth, you sound natural, how you actually sound. So one technique I learned was we call it talk, then transcribe. 
So you talk your speech and then you transcribe it into the, in, so you talk it into a dictaphone. This is my process. I literally talk, then transcribe. I talk my whole story. Then I write down what I've written. And I might add a little bit to, to enlarge the picture of a scene, maybe. I might change a word here and there, but generally talk, then transcribe. And that's what I did that made the biggest difference was talking and transcribing. And after I did that, uh, when I started to give workshop, people would say, Malachi, like, you're so conversational. You're so connected. You're just real. That's the key to it. You're so real. I, I get you. I feel you. And I even words like, instead of saying, she said in a, a bit of dialogue, I said, my wife was like, and because I actually say my wife was like, that's how I actually speak. And then the whole having to memorize my speech became less difficult because I'm actually only practicing what I've already said that is actually a part of me rather than me trying to, you know, be angry at myself because I'm forgetting the line that I meant to say because I've written it in a perfect way. So talk, then transcribe the technique. Basically, you're describing is it's amazing for connection. And, and now with, with some of the more recent technology, it's that's become easier as well because you can you can just record it and then run it through a subtitle a website or something. So you don't even have to actually listen and put it down. It's yeah, it's a lot easier. Yeah. And I think with stories, you know, which where we should get to <laughs> since we've done oh. almost half an hour and skirted around it. With stories, I would argue that you should you actually shouldn't write them down so even if you're practicing a speech and there is a story or stories in there I, you know as long as you can do the story in the time that you're supposed to do it i wouldn't write them down because they it does take away the spontane spontaneity of it it's just it sounds i mean unless you've rehearsed it so so much that you've gone past the sounding rehearsed thing but with stories you don't need yeah. to because you already remember them so you know what your, yeah. you know, I know what my story about meeting Javier Bardem at a pub in Ireland is. I don't need to rehearse that story. I know what it is. And as long as I can do it a few times to make sure I'm not including stuff that doesn't need to be there, then fine. I mean, that story is about three minutes long, right? Uh, you know, as long as I planned everything mm -hmm. else to, to have three minutes to 3.30, that shouldn't matter. But anyway, let's jump into, into story. Now, when you teaching people to do that, to use more stories in their presentations or speeches. Is there any type of structure that you tell them to use or do you sort of leave it to you know, their natural instincts to what, what should go where? Yeah. No, initially I say to people, like, just, just tell your story and get it out because a lot of people don't. The biggest thing I have is I don't have a story. I don't know what's so they say to me they don't have a story but if I'm talking to them before we get into like maybe a coaching session they would have told me a story like what they did today and, so, and I'm hooked and they've got all the elements so like I advise people to just tell a story and then it's just about putting the right piece in the right places so a lot of people have the whole story but the conflicts at the end everything's just all over the place so my my job really is to First, if you can't find a story, I say like searching four places. My one is your career, your circumstance, your childhood, and then chance encounters. So like if you've met a celebrity or if something strange happened when you were going somewhere. But I tell them to look at the four C's of where to find the story. And once they've got that, then I say literally just tell the story. But I think uh, there's a book called, is it The Power of Moments? by oh the it's the it's, they, it's, it's on, yeah it's on my list it's it's from the same guys that wrote made to stick Ch made chip to and then guys. heath i believe yeah that book so they talk about how you know some things happen to us and then noticeable like i don't know if you've ever been because i don't really like at a dinner party or conversation over the phone where you're literally just telling someone something and it's like you leave the conversation like that was a good story or you just have a moment and you think yes so it's like Helping people identify what the story is and where it is. And once I do that, I just tell them to, one, just tell your story. And then I say, okay, now let's bring it into a sort of structure. And I know there's the, is it the Hollywood, not Hollywood. The hero's journey. The hero's journey. And there's a Hollywood storytelling structure, which is kind of from the yeah, hero's journey the, as well. I think, there's the, I think some people call it the Pixar pitch. Or but yeah. the, the Ken Smith story spine. Um, the, but there, yeah, they're all based on the hero's journey. Mine's not as refined as the hero's journey, but I, I say like there's, there's seven P's that every story needs. And if you get them in, then generally you're hitting all the right spots. I say that your story needs a place, uh, a problem. I say personalities, 
I say pulling moments and pulling like with, with a problem. I say the absence of conflict is a presence of boredom. So you draw them in. Uh, personalities, that's your, your characters. Principles, and that's your like. What is the actual point or the phrase? What is the takeaway? I say pulling moments. And for me, in Toastmasters, this is probably the biggest thing that I think Toastmasters competitions kind of lack or stories that you think there's this, there's something missing. Because I used to I used to say to me, my wife, I said, darling, like, I'm hearing people tell stories. They're different from mine. There's there's something missing. It's just like a long story and then a point. I thought like, there's something missing. I feel like I'm outside the story. And then I realized what it was a pulling moment. And what I call a pulling moment is like where you say something like, my wife was going to the shopping centre and she asked me to buy some chips. And then you stop and you say, I say pulling moments where you beat your story on pause and your audience on play. So you come out of the story and you say, have you ever been there? You know, those times when you don't want to do something, but your wife asks you to do something. You know what I'm saying? And you might raise your hands, but you're actually stop telling the story, come out of the story and then move into the audience and say, have you ever? Do you remember a time? You know how it feels when... You make and it's a you fo- you focus pulling moment. And when I do that, sometimes the stories over here is on pause, and I'm talking to the audience. And there's banter, there's spontaneity, there's improv. People make comments, and that's actually the moment where your audience stop hearing a story and start having an experience. And then I come back from my pulling moment. I put my audience on pause, my story on play, and I do that two or three times inside the story. And then there's a connection that's built. And then afterwards, they say, oh, Malachi, like, my boss was like that. And we have this long thing after the speech because they didn't hear a story in an experience. So you've got pulling moments, principles, play, and then I say playfulness. I, my speech contest winning speech was very intense. I went to one of the world champions, Jim Key. He said, Malachi, your story was too intense. But I, I like heard he someone told, describe this as, um, ah, what, what is it? After a certain period in like all the speech competitions, everything was either cancer <laughs> or death or something like that. There, there was something yeah. else I can't remember. But it's everything is like a horrible misery. Um, it, it's just oh no, I don't want another one of those, please. <laughs> yeah, it was like literally like okay, everything's happening, everything's happening, and then boom, my wife dies. Yeah. My mom dies. It was yeah. just getting like this yeah. was the formula. Yeah, yeah. The formula to win yeah. The let me let me pick you up on, on on some stuff there. So just to recap, the 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 four C's uh, that you you say you, you tell people to go and find their stories, childhood circumstances, childhood. chance encounters, and career. Okay, career, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I find interesting that you. Well, when did you call them pulling moments? Because you know, I don't know how many storytelling books you've read, but in the in the sort of the storytelling world. A moment is a very specific thing. I mean, there is, there is, it's a, it's a term, and it's the one that everyone that sort of that you know reads the literature and whatever will refer to is the moment. Is that part of the story where more than any other time you are showing and not telling? All right. So, uh. so for example, if you're talking about so I, I you know, something I've told before, um, where a story I told before where I had this, I was in London. I had gone to a to a nightclub, no, not a nightclub. I had gone to um, the Redback Tavern in Acton, and it was a week night, so I had to work the next day very early in a, a hotel bar that I was I was working at, and then I left early, and then but I hadn't had a few drinks, and the next thing I knew, I woke up in a dark and empty bus, and I was like, where am I? And, and I was so drunk, so drunk that the first thing that came to my mind was, where exactly in the bus? is the place to pee. I'll, I'll leave it to the readers, the listeners' imagination if I actually peed inside the bus or not. Um, but then I, I had to press the emergency button. I got out of the bus. I was in the garage in Zone 6. Yeah, so you can, you know, for anyone who doesn't know London, Zone 6 is like a different city. Right? It took me, I had to wait an hour or two for the bus to start running again. It took me another hour and a half to get back home. So I had to start working, I think, at 9, and I got home at 
quarter past eight. So I, I slept wow. for 10 minutes, had a shower in tears. Like I was literally crying in the shower. And I was like, oh, my life is awful. And as I got out of the, I got out of the house, I was waiting in the, in the, to the train station for, for to go to work and then i saw on the floor this kebab wrap with some with some chips oh, on top oh, and oh, i looked at the chips oh, and i thought well they're still on top of the paper so, <laughs> oh, <laughs> right, so, so right. both me describing what happened in the bus and me describing the the the, the chips that was what most storytellers would call a moment. So it is just sort of super visual and all of that. And I don't actually think that most people that just deal with pure storytelling, not storytelling within a speech, would ever advocate yeah. for audience interaction. What they yeah. what people tend to do to get the same the same effect that you're going for is uh, I call this having a specific, so I want the story to be relatable, specific, and emotional. And the specific is about two things. It's about the moment, and it's about details. So, so you know, I could have said, you know, you know, when you have some, you buy some chips at a kebab, and it's, they come in like this, this triangle, uh, and there's some grease spots, and there's that little wooden fork uh, that always gets your fingers oh, yeah. dirty. Now, I don't need to say, have you ever bought those chips? Because if I picked my details yeah, yeah, yeah. right, you're going, yeah, 100%. I've bought those chips before. Yeah. So I think that's usually the approach that people typically will say is have a detail there that anyone that understands the world you're describing will go, yeah, yeah, that's it. You know, we, we're talking about Toastmasters. You can always say, oh, you know that thing where you're supposed to greet the, the contest chair? Like, yeah. we, we know what that is. So you go, yes, this guy has watched a competition, a Toastmasters competition before. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I think it's interesting that you call, one, that you would have that in there. Uh, I have that yeah. in speeches all the time. I wouldn't necessarily, I don't, yeah. I don't necessarily have it in the middle of a story. And uh, and the other thing that that I, I you know, you mentioned principles, which is, I think you're kind of describing the point of the story, right? Or the, the, the moral of the story. So when you do that, do you want, where do you want that point? Do you want it before or after? Yeah, so there's different approaches because sometimes it's tell a story and make a point, but sometimes it's make a point and tell a story. So sometimes, you know, I might say the absence of conflict is the presence of boredom. Boom. Because I've got this technique where I call it... Um, you know, like fishing, you go fishing, you've got a fishing rod and you need bait. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's a term called um, hook, line yes. and sinker. So I call it hook, line, then story. So I would say the absence of conflict is the presence of the border. And most people neglect conflict in their stories and they don't understand how much they can have the audience hanging on their every word. But I discovered how this can like be detrimental to your speech when I was talking to my wife. Boom. Hook, line, story. So I've made the point there, and then I'll come into the story, tell my dude, so remember, the absence of conflict is the presence of boredom. So I might do, tell us, um, make a point, tell the story, and then make the point at the end. But sometimes the, the, the principle is literally like you, you do your hook line, go into your story. The principle could be, sometimes the principle isn't like the, the phrase where in my speech contest, it was like, keep on walking, keep, it's not like that. Sometimes it's so, it's so, um, one line could be the principle, like literally, like you said in one of your speeches, was it, was it don't give up? What is the principle you had a few weeks ago? It struck give, a chord tell, me what me. The, um, tell me what the story is and I'll tell you what the principle was. It was about how things go, re went really wrong. And I think it was, was it a song line you took? Oh, it ain't over till it's over. It ain't over yeah, till it's, it's over. Well, yeah, it's, it or, was that, you know, if, if, if where you are now is not where you want to be, remember this is not the end of a story it's the end of a chapter yeah what was good about it was that the story was told and you only said it maybe once or whatever it was but the principle was there so sometimes it's just like you tell your story because i used to when i first started it was like i've got to put a principle in there i've got to put it in there five times ten times but then i realized that only maybe once or twice or maybe just once with a little and when i say principle i usually do it my, some of my other storytelling friends say that let the story let the story tell its own principle and allow the audience to kind of draw from it what they want. But sometimes, because of the type of like audience I'm speaking to, sometimes they I feel like they need to know where the story's going. There's two. It works either way, 
but sometimes it's just one one phrase. So my principles are usually wrapped up in a phrase. So I have a phrase that is like between zero and ten lines. And something that, that I principle. I think I be, I learned from Sean Callahan from Anecdote is he calls the relevance statement, and that's that's something that works mm -hmm. incredibly well for. For when you're trying to teach people to use storytelling in business, because the one of the biggest hurdles of using storytelling in business is the why the hell are you telling me this story problem? Uh, so, so what he oh, says, yeah. and you know, I don't have tested this and it works perfectly, is you just say one line, and, and that could be the connection to the story. So, someone is talking about how. I said, I, I told the story about my, my daughter waking up in the middle of the night and not wanting to go back to sleep. And then I tried to convince her and I reasoned with her and I threatened and I did all these things. Nothing worked. And then I started crying and that worked. And, you know, you're talking to people about how they're trying to convince people with reason, but they're not connecting emotionally. All right. So you can say, you know, our message is not really resonating. And then you can say something like, I found that if you can't connect emotionally, sometimes you just you just never get anywhere. Like last week, my daughter woke up and, and then you don't have to say it again. By the time I get to the end of my story, it's obvious what I've what you know what the point is. And he would talk about he just say something like, you know, sometimes uh, sometimes we don't really know our audience. We know we're not talking the same language as they are. And then, you know, I can tell the story about how I took my wife out for a nice dinner and asked her to wear something nice because I had a surprise and she thought I was going to propose and I didn't. Uh, so, yeah, but set it up and then you let the story do the work because you've already made the point. Uh, I, I, I agree. It's dangerous yeah. to just tell a story without being kind of obvious of what the point is if you're trying to use it object you know strategically for business or anything like that i mean even in like um so like when i'm selling <laughs> selling you shouldn't really be selling it's, it's, it's sometimes a dirty word but if i'm trying to sell something there's a difference so there's a story that makes a point that people you know that you have a message from but then there's also like a story such as to sell a product we call it like what i've learned it's called then now and how And the then, now, and how storytelling structure is like, is weird because I had to do it as a part of something I was learning on a course. And how we did it was that you would tell them that I, I said, oh, um, I was a Toastmaster and I won the UK and Ireland Public Speaking Championship in nine months. I just didn't know how I did it then. Now I get paid to speak and I sell products and help people tell great stories and I've got the confidence to do it. And how? How is in a book that I put together called Smash It With A Story. So it's like, then what happened? Now, here's my reality. But the how is in your product. So there's different ways that you can kind of use kind of the, storytelling. That in, one seems in, like in, a version of something I I was just talking about a couple of shows back with Park Howell, which is called The, the End, But, and Therefore. Yeah, so you know, oh, I was yeah, I was yeah, doing yeah. all these speeches yeah. and I competed and won some stuff, but I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. But it's, it's a slightly yeah. different approach to that because you're not trying to say I fixed it and this is how I did it. It's this is the setup. Now we have a problem, and now we're going to come up with some sort of resolution. It's funny you can't. Here, I want to say to like maybe some people listening, you you can't avoid storytelling. Like it is one, it's a game changer, but two, it is breathing when it comes to communication or it should it should like be it's hard to, it should be and i'm seeing more and more that so many different entrepreneurs and businesses are coming into a place where they are really recognizing storytelling my wife's actually on a, on a course by um this great you know, millionaire doing his whatever he's doing but a part of his course is that you have to do something called a whiteboard webinar webinar so if you're an entrepreneur you probably know where that is You know, it's a lead magnet to get a, a bigger audience. So you've got to do some training on a whiteboard. Now, one of the modules is that you have to tell a story. And I said, darling, so you, you can't escape this. But the story structure is one I, I hadn't actually seen before. Uh, and I've read a lot of storytelling. And he, his thing is that you have to tell a story. But your, your first point, the first point, you tell your story. But the first point that you make in the story is a transformational promise. So you might say something like, I, I did this and it, may, it helped me make this much of income. Then the second point in the story is to deal that you make is to deal with the objections that your promise suggests. 
So you've got to kind of think about what would the audience be thinking as an objection? Oh, you're, you're, you got lucky, you were young, or you had a, a rich inheritance. The third point will be you make is to give them permission for you to sell. And I'm like, wow, like there is a that's lot not, of... That's not really a story though, is it? I mean, it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a pitch or a speech structure. Um, I would call it a because this is, this is where I, I, you know, I don't really care what we call it. You know, it's more important that we're using it and how we're using it. But, but this is where I get a bit, you know, there's some, some things are stories. Some things are not stories. So if I say to you, the first and only time I went fishing with my dad, I think was the first time he went fishing because I don't think he had any idea what he was doing. He didn't think he needed a fishing rod. So he got the the line, he got the hook, and he didn't get worms. I, now, I don't know if he just thought they were disgusting or he just thought he knew better. He got prawns. Prawns is what he bought to wow. use as bait. So we were <laughs> hooking these prawns into the, hooking these prawns and like throwing the line into the water. And, and some of them started catching like, but you know, the fish were just eating the prawns and we were left with bits. And then at some point, I think he just realized how ridiculous that was. We just took the prawns home and cooked them. Uh, now that's a story, right? I could yeah. top and tail that with a lesson and do a whole thing around it. But that thing I just told is the story. All this other stuff, yeah. you're making you're making the story sort of the meat of your presentation sandwich. But but they're not the story yeah. anymore, you know. Uh, so you know, the relevant statement is not the story. The relevant statement is the how you get into the story, how you make your point ahead of time, how you tell people why you should be listening to me. It's not the story. Yeah, yeah I think his concept was trying to use stories to deal with the objections of the audience. So you're, you're using a story now. So it's part number one is you're selling the transformation. You use a story to illustrate transformation. But now your transformation has built an object um, objection. So people are like, I can't do this, I can't do that. So if you're thinking you can't do this, then hey, check this out. Da, da, da. So it's really, it's a weird, I mean, the guy's a millionaire, so he's probably done a lot of NLP and stuff like that too. But like, yeah, I think that like what you illustrated that, because I was listening to your fishing story just now, and it's like keeping the purity of storytelling. It's like, you don't really have to do that much work if you tell a story authentically. And you, you don't. Do and this is something you, you were saying before. So you were saying that you have your seven Ps of story. And what I believe is true is that, you know, there's a few things that the brain is looking for to, to figure out if it's a story. The very first thing is time and place. The moment you start saying something like, you know, I yesterday I, well, hold on, this sounds like a story. Then, you know, usually uh, there is a character. It's like, you know, you're not, it's not an opinion you're giving. It's happened to me, happened to my wife, happened to my friend, whatever. And then there's a sequence of events. There is some type of problem uh, there. And there, and there will be some learning at the end. There will be a, an aha moment. There will be a surprise. That's what a story is. And my yes. experience with you know social media, for example, is if you watch every pretty much every single video that I put out, it's almost always a story, and there is no intro. I mean, you could maybe argue that whatever is written on the post is the intro, is the relevant statement. But I always start them saying, many years ago when I was living in London, and I just tell the story. I'm not trying yeah. to make it interesting. I'm not putting something, you know, I, I call this the WTF, right? I want the interest to be WTF. Weird, thought-provoking, yeah. or funny. I don't do it. I'm like, I just assume that the story is going to grab you. The moment I say, 10 years ago, blah, 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 you, your brain goes, oh, hold on. Maybe I'm going to learn something here. And 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 I think that sometimes, particularly if you've been trained as a speaker before you've been trained as a storyteller, you forget that yeah. your story, again, you're not going to hold their attention for a minute if nothing is happening for a minute. But for the first 10, 20 seconds, <laughs> all you, you need is to make it sound like a story. If I start saying, well, yeah. there's many things that I've learned in my life, and some of them were, you lost me already. There's sto like, sto like you're right, stories have enough power to, it, I don't know, I mean, there's the science studies that it's releasing certain things in the brain and, you know, wired for story and things like that. And I do believe if your intro doesn't really create a question in the mind of the audience, it could even be, don't look for this deep question. Like, if you don't create a question, 
then your audience won't stay alone because the mind can't deal with unanswered questions. So curiosity and con- conflict, like if you've got that. So that's why pe- people are listening because they want to, not that they're nosy, it's just this thing in your mind, you want the answer to it. Like, a, you know, so I guess, like you said, if the story is a story and there's curiosity and conflict in there, people will carry along. All the other techniques are, they're all right, but people will carry and come into your story and be drawn into it. So yeah, I do believe that story story has Let its me own just power. Talk about one more thing before we completely run out of time and I haven't asked something that that I definitely wanted to talk to you about, okay. which is the fact that you do do a lot of or used to do a lot of your speaking at church, right? You know, I actually referenced that, you know, you talked about sex in church, so we probably should explain what that is almost an hour into the to the recording. So yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to one understand how how do you find that different, if it's different at all, than, than other speaking? So what, what works, what doesn't work? Uh, because, you know, I, that, that's, I have, that's a completely alien experience to me. So I'm, I'm blessed enough to come from a background where the audience is responsive. So while I'm speaking, like, you can just, instant feedback, you know it's good. Amen. Hallelujah. They'll get out of the chair. Preach it. You know, like, so I'm blessed that the audience give you live feedback. What's good for me is that in the in the church world, especially like where the background I'm coming from, they're not used to storytelling. They're used to like the Bible says la 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 la. I mean, the Bible is a, the parables are stories. People remember the story, you know, the, the Good Samaritan. That's a story. You're right. In my book, um, especially with the story, it said my, the first quote is there. It said it says, "Without a story, he taught them not." And that is in. Let me just even look. There's a first quote on the, like the first page here. It says. Chapter one, without a story, he taught them not. Mark four, verse 34. Jesus was a storyteller and most of his content was stories that he wouldn't teach people without telling them a story. In the church world, they're like, oh, we've got to read the Bible. But I came like with something different. I started to tell stories about my wife, my this, my that. And the thing is, because they were kind of unconsciously formal, they're like, hold on. Here's actually a human being who's connecting with me. And now people who are like very refined are laughing. And so for me, I brought a different mode of communication to my church. So it's like they will always be excited when I'm speaking because I was real. I was transparent. So it actually helped me. That was my battle. Do I speak how I actually speak or do I do the religious thing? Because I was very unrefined and unreligious. It worked. But then, so what I learned from that the world of speaking helped me in church but what I learned from like, the rule of three and not speaking for too long, but then what I learned from church helped me in the world of speaking because you go into a presentation and people were kind of more reserved, laid back. The in, in church, you might say something like, turn to your neighbor and say, God is good. You know, the interaction of speaking in church, like I'm used to people being alive and lively and giving them talk. I was like, I'll say to the audience, talk back to me. Come on, guys. So I'm using the techniques I've used that I've, come from a church background in the professional world and then in the professional world I'm using it to structure and tell stories and use metaphors so it was almost like this perfect merge and then obviously hearing that Jesus was a storyteller I'm like he's the Bible says that he spoke to multitudes that's literally thousands of people and being able to hold their attention he said that the device I look at the, the, the devices that he's using and I'm like if storytelling was important to someone who had a mass following or whatever I'm like Hey, I'm going to yeah, jump well, on that bandwagon. Yes, that some could argue that if it was good enough for Jesus, it's <laughs> good enough for you. But you know, I watched oh, one. I, I mean, there's oh, not many videos of you talking in church, but <laughs> there was there was one that I, you do. I think you had something to do with. Uh, let, I think you had the "Let's Get It On" song playing, and that was you talking about sex. But the one oh, the one I really liked was. If I remember the story well, essentially it was about your daughter. She was watching TV. You were trying to do something else. And then you talk about how, you know, the, the, the noise is, pr- is concerning. But, but, li- but when you hear silence, that's even worse. And, and I think she, what she was trying to do yeah. was get some CDs that were too high for her. And then your yeah. whole thing was, was it then you grow? Like a lot of people, when they're going through something, they're moaning. You know, and I say you don't, um, you don't get to the next level if you grown g-r-o-a-n like you're groaning you get it if you're you've grown g-r-o-w-n so it's like you don't groan to the next level yeah i think i I think i've heard someone say something like you know uh don't go through it grow through it 
I think your line was yeah. grow and you will you reach it or grow and you'll get it, which is quite funny because you're telling a, you're telling like a five year old is like grow and you will reach it. Like what it's gonna take three years, Dad. <laughs> you know, so yeah, and that's another point you make. Like what I realize is, and this is my my law number one of um storytelling, is that people respond to what they relate to. So like if they can relate, so church audience, and it wasn't as it wasn't strategic. I'm speaking to a church audience, so I need to have a family story in there. It's not that strategic. Although I might tell someone like to do something like that, but I didn't think of it like that. But I realized that people respond to what they relate to. And I find the hardest stories that I tell is when like I say your backstory will kill your story. So like sometimes if people can't respond to what they relate to, and then you're giving this backstory about like, say, for example, if I have to explain Toastmasters in church and it takes me like a whole 90 seconds or two minutes to explain what Toastmasters is, my backstory has now actually yeah. killed my story. Maybe just 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 see that backstory, leave it alone or just get content that, you know, the audience will relate to. So that's how I sort of navigated being in the church world. And then with the church world as well, the delivery dynamics is like I can shout. They're used to that. Like I can shout. I can be loud. I can ah, whatever it is. But. As soon as, like, you, like, if you, sometimes if you watch some of, like, in my sermon, or well, I don't speak in church as much anymore, but my message there, and my message, it would be the same story, but I tone it all down. Because the African-American and Black audience and Afro-Caribbean audience, they're like, if you're not shouting, like, in a Pentecostal church, it's like, they don't think that, <laughs> they might think that oh, <laughs> God's not using the person. For real, it's a cultural, deal. but my mentor, one of my mentors, Jim Key, well, at the time of Toastmaster, he said that you can motivate without shouting. I've had to look into it, and I've got like this thing called the Promised Land Principle in my book, um, Public Speaking Hacks. And I realized that if you show them like the promise, if you do this, this will happen. And if, but if you don't do this, you might find that you'll be in this place. That's enough motivation. Like if you find a pain point, I said pain is an acronym. You find the, you know, um, that what brings them pleasure what um, their aspirations are, what their interests are, and what their need is. And you speak around that and you say, if you do this, but if you don't do this, like you show them the promised land and the wilderness, that's enough motivation. Whether you shout or not, that's already, they know that there's consequence and reward, a blessing and a curse, sowing and reaping, karma. Like you can set up your destiny and teach them personal responsibility. Then you can kind of strip out all that. I don't even need to shout. You have to say, hey, guys, oh, you know, you got to want it bad. No, like show them the wilderness that they're in and the promised land that they could get. And then my mentor Craig has said, always say like people hate the word most people. So when you say like most people won't take action on this <laughs> or most speakers neglect this. And people don't want to be most people. People want to be world class. So they want to be, so you show them this side and that side. So I learned how to kind of motivate without shouting. Yeah, I've, and that I've described really that before, me. the picture you painted there. Um, I've described it as um, that most stories or the most powerful stories are someone moving from pain to power. So by, by the end of it, you need to be mm. able to do something you weren't able to do before. That, 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 that would have got an A in church. Woo! Uh, all right, my man. So, if um, if people want to to find you and and the stuff you're doing, where should they go to? So, the best place to go is to go to LinkedIn, or you could go to my blog, which is Public Speaking Hacks. www.publicspeakinghacks.com. It's been a great pleasure, my man. And to everyone else, thanks for tuning in. Take care of yourselves, and until next time. I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, I'd love for you to subscribe and leave us a review or a rating on the Apple Podcasts app. It's very easy. You open the app and find this show. Then scroll down a little, and when you see the stars, tap. I'd really appreciate it, and it does help other people find us. And if you'd like to get in touch or find out more about what I do, reach out to me on LinkedIn or visit my website, storypowers.com. <laughs>